So I'm here joined by the email legend Jean Jennings. She is the CEO of Email Optimization Shop, General Manager at Only Influencers, the email marketing group, and Program Chair for the Email Innovation Summit. So I think it's worth us starting with how did you get into marketing in the first place? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Jenna, for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm really excited to be here. And congratulations on publication of your book. I think that's so awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for asking. You know, it's funny because I, I got the questions in advance and I had to sort of think about how did I get into marketing? It's kind of funny because I went to, um, went to college, undergrad, and I majored in economics and political science, a double major, both of which I loved. And then I actually went directly on to um, get my MBA, Master's of Business Administration. And I remember in my M in first year of MBA, I had a marketing class. And I loved it. Something about it just spoke to me. I felt like I was good at it without even trying, if that makes any sense. If you ever had the experience where you're just like, oh my gosh, it's like I was born to do this. And that's when I really fell in love with marketing. So um, for my MBA, I took all of my electives were marketing classes. So that got me a concentration in marketing. Um, and that's really how I got into it. And so it's kind of funny. I had felt that way about economics and about poli sci and undergrad, which is why I went that direction there. But yeah, the marketing just really, it really stuck. I enjoyed it. It was really fun. I felt like I did well at it. And so that's kind of how I got into it. And I've kind of never looked back. So almost like a natural fit, which is quite amazing. I know. In my, let's see, I had one job when I was with uh, Reed Elsevier. Uh, I was head of email product development and I was, um, I wasn't young, but I guess I was like in my thirties and I probably looked like I was in my twenties. I looked kind of young and, uh, I was dealing with all these older people. And I remember just like talking to my boss and saying, I don't understand why they won't listen to me. It's like, this is in my DNA. It's like, I know this, like the back of my hand and, um, and they weren't terrible. We got a lot done, but I just remember it was really funny. People would think I was sort of crazy because I was so passionate about it, about the email marketing, about the marketing. And I just, and they would just be like. She thinks she knows what she's doing. My boss would be like, she does. <laughs> you just watch. Yeah. <laughs> just watch. She knows what she's doing. Um, so, yeah. So that's kind of fun. I would tell everyone, I think that, um, you know, the best jobs are the jobs that we're passionate about, that we love, either because we love what we're doing or we're working for a good cause. And, um, you know, over the years I've worked, you know, when I was in college, poli sci major, I would read Congressional Quarterly at the library, which was a publication about Congress and nonpartisan and very highly respected. And then I got to work at Congressional Quarterly for three years as an adult. And, um, you know, that was just like magic for me because I loved the work I was doing. I felt strongly about the publication that I was doing it for. So that's one thing I always tell people. If you can follow what you're passionate about, assuming you can make a living at it, um, that I think is a good thing to do. You seem to, to really like the email marketing too. You seem to really kind of jam on it and feel like you're, and you totally know what you're talking about. You're so smart. Um, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. do, you, do you feel that way too about email marketing? Are you just like so passionate? Yeah. And I feel like it's a natural fit. Like you've just, you know, I completely relate to that. I'm, I'm really fascinated with marketing and just my kind of passion is and how why I got into marketing was because I was passionate about making the customer experience better mm -hmm. and I felt like I could do that with marketing and that was my my whole angle how can I make this better for the end user how can I make this better for the recipient how can I make this better for the customer and that's like my my passionate piece um, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting that you say about passion because that's been mentioned quite a few times of really try to align the industry or or the the aspect or the angle that you're going in at with your passion so you do really enjoy what you're doing yeah it makes it a lot lot better yeah I totally agree so you've got quite a few different hats that you wear <laughs> <laughs> what does your current role involve like where I wouldn't say like what's your typical day look like because I know it'd be so different but you know how would you describe like your role and what you do wow um Overall, it's funny. I kind of feel like I am an evangelist trying to help make email marketing better, which is probably much too grandiose for what I actually do. I feel like is, um, I, first of all, I'm really lucky 
because I have my own consultancy, email optimization shop, and I work directly with clients. So I do a lot of strategy. I like to roll up my sleeves and work on campaigns. Um, I love what you said about making experiences better for the customer um, because I like doing that. And what I find is by making things better for the customer, you usually improve your bottom line performance because if it's better for the customer, they're probably going to buy more. They're going to buy more frequently. They're going to tell their friends. For email optimization shop, which primarily pays my mortgage, um, it's really doing strategy with clients and then staying around and helping them implement a lot of A-B split testing, which I love to do. And we've gotten some really good results on campaigns. Um, I had a campaign that we did over the holidays uh, for a client, and we actually, um, through a bunch of different things, but we generated 64% more revenue this year than, than they generated last year. And that was 2020 over 2019. And I don't know about you, but COVID really kind of hit things hard here. So, but, um, so that's yeah, fun. And, impressive. you know, only influencers, I took that over a little over a year ago when Bill McCloskey, who was the founder, retired. Um, for those of you who may not know, oh, only influencers is a community of email industry professionals. Um, and it sounds really crazy, but we, um, we get together and we talk about email. We talk about it on a discussion list that we have. We talk about it live on a Zoom call every Thursday. We bring in speakers. And um, again, the, the focus is really community, but really helping everyone improve the email marketing that they're doing. Because I feel like the more good email marketing is out there, the better it is for the industry. Yeah. And, um, right. There's plenty of bad email marketing, so there's plenty of work to go around for those of us trying to help make it better. Um, so true. And OI, <laughs> yeah, and OI is just great because it's you know the people in the industry are so nice. This industry, you know, has always had this history of helping people out. Um, competitors working together with competitors on industry initiatives. Um, people who've been in the industry helping new people in the industry do better. So that's one of the things that's really important with only influencers. And that's one of the things we want to maintain this idea of making contacts and again, just helping everyone do better email marketing um, so that the industry thrives. And then email innovation summit is connected to only influencers. It's their annual conference. And it's such an honor to be the programming chair for that. Um, unlike a lot of other shows, we do take proposals that are submitted from people to speak, but it's a curated show. So I know the things I want to talk about. We're completely focused on innovation. You were a keynote last year and did a great job talking about customers and what they're looking for. And it's just, um, it's such a pleasure to be able to put together this group of great speakers and provide such value um, to the people who attend. And uh, it's really fun. So. It's a brilliant conference. So basically your role means that you never sleep because you do so much, so much, literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's awesome. So what, what advice would you share for anyone that's aspiring and an aspiring marketer or email marketer specifically? You know, I think the best advice I could give someone, um, especially someone new who's, who's in this industry or really an end industry is to network. Um, getting connected to other people um, and networking both up and down. So helping people who you can help and then allowing people who can help you to do that. Um, and networking is really what it's all about. You know, um, another hat I wear is I'm an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. I teach digital marketing in the graduate school. So that's only one class a year. But um, my class is... Um, we don't, have, we don't have a textbook because digital marketing is changing so fast. It doesn't make any sense. But the other thing that we do is every class, we have a guest speaker. So it's someone I know from the industry who's working in whatever channel we're talking about that night, and they come in and share their experience. And it's really wonderful. The students always have great questions. They always love hearing from the speakers. The speakers are so generous with their time to come talk to the class. And my last question to the speakers is always, can the students reach out to you on LinkedIn to connect? And I've yet to have a guest speaker say no. They all say yes. And I really encourage the students, you know, if you reach out to every guest speaker we have this year, that would be 14 guest speakers. You reach out to them on LinkedIn and connect with them. You never know in the future how they might come in handy. You might be looking for an internship or a job. You might be looking for a vendor. Um, you might be, you know, there's a million ways that those connections could help you in the future. And this is the time to do it. And it costs you nothing to do it. 
Um, and it's funny because they often say, but I don't feel like I have anything to offer that person. I would rather reach out when I can offer them something. And I say, you know what? You got to reach out now because you made the connection. You just met them. And there's things that we can offer people that aren't related to our job or monetary. Whenever I have a guest speaker, I always post on LinkedIn, hey, thanks so much for speaking to my class. And I say a little something about what they said. And I say to my students, you know, just liking that and sharing it helps that speaker because it helps get the word out that they are do this, that they're knowledgeable. So that was really a long-winded way of saying just network, network and be open to helping people who you can help and accept help from others. And don't be afraid to ask for it. You'd be surprised how many people would be willing to help. Yeah, such great advice there, particularly with the speaker side of things. So I think it's probably a little bit of a lack of confidence maybe of the students, but you're completely right. You know, you've, they've built that connection already and then it starts a conversation with somebody. It doesn't always have to be a a commercially based conversation just getting to know someone is a brilliant way of starting to grow your network so if we focus on email marketing what do you think are the main challenges to creating an email marketing strategy <laughs> <laughs> there's a few i know <laughs> what do you think yeah. of the main ones? wow um you know I, I think the main one is lack of time i think that there's so much going on in the world. I don't know about you, but you know, I'm at my desk. We're in a pandemic, so I'm just home. I'm not traveling, but I have my phone that goes off with phone calls and things. I've got my email. Um, and you know, there's things that need to get done. And so I think that the biggest challenge that I see the clients I work with is is they're just um, you know, they're kind of just on this treadmill where they have to get the emails out. And a lot of times it's surprising to me, they don't even really have time to like follow up and look at the results because they're always just on to the next one. So I think the first is time. I think the second is I'm not sure a lot of people really know how to go about putting together a strategy. Um, I don't know about you, but when I wrote my book, which was published a long time ago, um, the most difficult section of the book for me was the one on strategy. Um, and I wrote it. And then, of course, I sent it to my editors and they were like, we don't understand what you're talking about. You've got to rewrite it. Um, and that was the one that we went back and forth, I think, five or six times. And when I started really thinking about my process for strategy, um, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. I think everyone has a different process. But for me, the process for strategy is just really immersing in the client, in their target audience, in the emails they're doing, looking at everything they're doing, just immersing in the industry. and then. It's weird. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like in my mind, these pieces start appearing and you get bits and pieces of it. And then as you keep immersing and you keep getting more data and you keep kind of analyzing and thinking about it, all of a sudden the jigsaw puzzle's done, all the pieces are in place and you can see the strategy and you can write it. But for me, it's very much that kind of a process. I've tried to, you know, force it and rush it. You know, I'm going to sit down and get the strategy done in three hours, come hell or high water. It doesn't work. You've got to look at it and think about it and walk away and get more data. So I think that's the other thing with strategy. I think that, you know, I've even seen people well, where they're, well, there's just a template you fill in and that's okay. But for me, it's much more of an organic process. And so I think that's the other reason people have trouble with strategy and, and, and those fill in the blank templates. I mean, they can be helpful but I, I, I'm not sure you get the very best strategy out of it necessarily, but that could just be me. I don't know. How did you find it? Did you? Yeah. Did you strategy. Well, it took me three years to write that book. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I wrote mine in a year and I was yeah. still behind deadline. Yeah, no. So it was like three years for the initial idea and then to get it physically in people's hands three years and predominantly I think the biggest the biggest kind of challenge with it was to be able to put it in a I really wanted it to be like a manual so it's practical because I think that is the challenge with strategy that everybody kind of looks at it and thinks oh, well it's going to take forever it's going to take too much time and we're just going to create this massive document we're going to shove it in a drawer and we're never going to look at it again 
Mm-hmm. And strategy shouldn't be like that. It should be quite iterative and you should be reviewing it regularly. Living um, and breathing document that you completely. update, add to and change. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rather than, right, we've said it and now we walk away and we forget about it and now we just run off to tactics. Right. I think that for me, that was like the biggest challenge of how do I get that mix in of being able to explain this really clearly in a way that everybody's going to understand and relate to with examples and put it in a practical format so that there's frameworks and there's templates in there, but it is, yeah. it's still very much needs a lot of data feeding into that and it's very unique to each business. Yeah. So I completely agree. I think, I think we've been missing a clear step by step framework of, these are all the things you need to think about including in the strategy and this is how you need to think about doing that and then the doing part is is the bit that you know marketers and business owners need to do so that's all what I've that's what I've spent a lot of time pulling together and and including in the book to make that easier because I've I don't I'm, I've gone into businesses and I've worked with companies that have never had a clear strategy or they think they have and it's very tactical driven and yeah. um, I think sometimes email gets into a place where it's it's brought in as it's going to be like the golden goose and it's going to deliver yeah. because it always delivers. Right. But that strategy piece, it doesn't always work that way and then everybody blames the email. I don't yeah. know if you've seen this. A lot. Um, I had, so I have a kind of a funny story. Years and years ago, um, I was at a conference and uh, a gentleman approached me and said, hey, a couple of us from my company, we're going out to dinner. We'd love to have you join us. And I said, okay. So I joined them for dinner. Well, it turned out dinner was all about trying to get as much information out of me as possible to folks their email campaign, which that's fine, right? I mean, I guess it was a little bit, it was a little uncomfortable. It was just sort of like, oh, I'm so tired. But, you know, I, I, I survived. So I saw them at the conference next year and I was like, hey, you know, it's good to see you. How you doing? Um, I think at the end of it, I offered to send them a proposal. I think I sent them a proposal and they said, oh no, we're good. We got enough at dinner. <laughs> I was like, okay. See them the next year and they go, wow, you know, we're really glad that we didn't hire you. And I said, why? Well, you know, we implemented all the ideas we got from you at dinner. There were a lot of them and none of them worked. Not one of them worked. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, like what? Well, you said to start a newsletter. So we started a newsletter. That was a bust. And I'm like, well, like, what kind of content did you have in the newsletter? You know, you know the drill, right, Jenna? Because the content matters a lot. Um, how you're putting it forward. Timing, segment. There's so many pieces, you know. There's so many pieces. So that kind of taught me to be very careful because um, as much as you can try to explain to someone how to do things right, um, yeah, like there's, there's, it's almost like whispering down the lane and the implement, implementation doesn't necessarily match. So, um, so yeah, you've got to be really careful. And that's, that's the problem with a lot of these companies that don't have experience doing strategy, no matter how much you try to talk to them about it. Um, or even if they read about it, it's hard to grasp. So, you know, that's one thing I really liked about your book, the step-by-step to really try to give people a good guideline to work by. Um, but yeah, that can be really, really difficult. Yeah. So that's a, that's a brilliant story. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think are the main challenges with clients when implementing email marketing? So you've mentioned a couple there, but what what do you think is the main challenge when they're implementing email? I think one challenge is that a lot of companies are kind of almost in a rough in a rut with email. This is how we do it. We do this and we pull it into this template and then we send it and then we do it again. And and they don't really think about the fact that email is not about the send. Email is about the content and how your recipients interact with the content. And it doesn't matter if you send everything on time all day long. If the content's not good and it's not driving that interaction, it's not going to be successful. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it. I think the other is um, a lot of times there's just sort of a lack of a strategic point of view with email. You know, um, for instance, um, resends. So one thing that I did with my client for the holiday campaign last year is we did a lot of what I call strategic resends. So a lot of people will say, oh, that email worked. Let's send it to the whole list again. (laughs) Or let's send it to the people that didn't open it. Um, And uh, what I find with resends is 
I find it's much more effective to send to the people who clicked but didn't know, but didn't convert, which sounds really odd and very counterintuitive, right? Because if they clicked on a link and then they didn't end up buying, well, they must not have been interested. But what I found is when you send just to those people who clicked but didn't convert, A, you're dramatically decreasing your risk of spam complaints and unsubscribes because it's a small group and they already showed that they were interested in this. Um, we get dramatic increases in conversion rates. Um, the median conversion rate increase for the campaign we did last year was 953%. So that's almost 10 times the revenue per email we got on the original send. Um, so the revenue tends to be very high. Um, again, unsubscribes, almost unheard of. Spam complaints, never. Um, and my theory is people get to that point where they're ready to buy and they just get distracted. Maybe they get a phone call. Maybe we're all working from home now. Maybe a kid comes in with a scraped knee and you've got to fix that. Maybe they're just slightly on the fence. So if you resend it, we tend to get dramatic, dramatic increases in conversion rate and revenue per email. And that's a very simple thing and very low risk. But those are the sort of things that through my years of doing this, I mean, my book was published in 20. 2007. And I was already, you know, doing this a lot then. And um, by doing it and playing with it and, and looking at the results, I've been able to see that it really doesn't make sense to resend the whole list or even to resend the people that didn't open. The only resends I ever do now are the ones to people who clicked but didn't convert. So I think just sort of thinking of things in that way and trying to be more strategic about it is something that a lot of people lose on the implementation. Um, and again, I think it has to do with kind of a lack of timing. Um, you know, I had a client recently, an AB split test was done on personalization. We all assumed the personalized version was going to win, right? Cause it usually does. Yeah. And I got on the phone with, with, uh, the CMO and he said, yeah, we're really excited. We're going to roll out on that personalization thing next week. And I still oh, good. How did the test do? Oh, I, I mean, we haven't looked, but I'm sure it did well. And then I pulled it up and the personalized version that had lost, it had depressed response depressed revenue per email, depressed conversion rate. And I said, I don't think we can roll out on this. And he was like, that doesn't make any sense. And I go, well, no, but you know, let us do a deep dive. We'll figure out what happened. We'll test it again. But I think that's the other thing that happens. People are so sort of, well, it worked for them. So it's got to work here. And then they just start doing it. And then sometimes it's too late. Sometimes they start doing it and it's, you know, months later or years later. And you're like, oh, that was a bad move. So yeah, so dangerous to roll out without reviewing the results. I know. Even when you think that's why we test, right? Because even you and I, so I'm usually right. I've got a really good track record, but every once in a while I'm not. And so that's why we test, right? To make sure that we're going in the right direction. Well, we're not the audience. So you know, audience. that's that that's where data is so important and the testing is so important to find out who are the audience. What do they like? What do they not like? Yeah. And even products, I had a client recently, we did a lot of testing around the number of products to include in the email. And we came up with the point, I think, I think we came up with that five or six number was really good. More than that, and we saw less response. Fewer than that, we saw less response. So we had a marketing manager there, God bless her, and she was bound and determined she wanted 12 products in the email. So we talked her down to nine, and then we tested it against an email that had, I think, maybe six and the nine did better. And we think it was yeah. because the type of product it was, um, you know, it was a product category email. So some products in this case, it was apparel. So there were a lot of different kinds of apparel that could be featured. Now the other categories they have are things like drinkware. So even though you might have a lot of different drinkware, it's still sort of drinkware. So we think it has to do with the, the variety inherent in that product category um, and so the next time we mailed that product category, we're actually going to go out with nine as the control. And then we're going to test 12 products, which is what she originally wanted and see how that does. So that's the other thing. I think we have to go outside what we learn and, you know, we double test, we tested that with a different product line and still the six products beat the nine. So that's another thing you have to take into account, not only what works overall, but then start sub segmenting for different products or different audiences, different things might work. Yeah, of course. And I suppose, I suppose there's more, you know, things change. It's almost like looking at your email there as like an Instagram feed of products. 
effectively depending on the demographic that they're sending to so that all starts to have an impact on the expectation of what you're going to see in the email definitely definitely and you know we find there's so many differences in audiences and it's just that's one of the things that i just love about this job the idea of ab split testing seeing what wins um and just learning from it so yeah keeps you on your toes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> So what do you think are the most common pitfalls that face an email marketer and how can they overcome them? Well, I think one is what we talked about earlier is that whole um, email send deadline treadmill where you're just on the treadmill. But, you know, I think the other thing is even, to, even sometimes when, when people are trying to do the right thing, um, they don't necessarily have the right tools or the right knowledge to make it effective. Um, I was working with a client and I asked if they did any testing and they said, oh, we AB split test all the time, all the time we AB split test. And I said, that's great. Um, and I went to talk to the marketing person and um, I said, well, this is, this is awesome. You know, why did you test the yellow buttons versus the blue ones? And she said, well, you know, they told us we needed a test. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just change the button color and see what happens. And it's better than not testing at all, I guess. But, um, you know, something like scientific method, which I follow very strictly with my clients, where you start with a hypothesis. You know, what's going on with this email? What are we seeing? Um, so, for instance, years ago, I had an email where the brand colors were a dark, dark purple and red, which sounds awful, but it was actually quite, quite nice. It was a financial publication. So they were trying, they were basically providing stock tips. So, in the email, the buttons were red. And um, I started, um, it was actually like in the Barnes & Noble bookstore one Sunday with a coffee, just looking over books. And there was a book on color and I picked it up and I started reading and it just sort of really was fascinating. And, you know, then I started thinking about this email because red is the color of stop signs. If you look at a stoplight when you're driving, red is the color that means stop. In financial terms, being in the red is a really bad thing. It means you're losing money. So I got to thinking about all that. And then I thought, you know, maybe the red button is actually subconsciously depressing response. So then I was like, well, what color should we test with? And we could test with purple. That's the other color. But then I got to thinking it through. And I thought, you know, on that stoplight, green is the sign of go. Green is the color of money. Making money is good. So we actually tested making the buttons green, which was heavens outside of the brand guidelines. Um, but it boosted response. So I think there's a lot of things like that that are subconscious in marketing, but that's the idea. Scientific testing got us that increased, that increased uh, in revenue per email because we thought through what color that button should be to try to boost response. And that's the kind of thing that I think is missing when I see a lot of marketers out there. Either they're not familiar with scientific method, they haven't been trained on it. Um, some people poo-poo it, which I'm a real fan of it. So um, I think that's the other piece is just sort of understanding and knowing. I think, you know, reading case studies for me is always fascinating and I actually love publishing case studies. So that's one thing I would say for, for marketers who are in a rut or they're looking to try to improve, you know, read some case studies, see what other people are trying. Not that you should just do what they say works, but it'll give you ideas for things to test in your own marketing program and try to do, try to come up with a hypothesis. It's not just doing any old test. It's doing something that you think will improve performance and have a reason for why you think that. Yeah, exactly. Asking that question, why, why is this working? Why isn't this working? Oh, I love that about the colors. That's brilliant. Yeah. So from all of that experience that you've gained, what advice would you give a younger self if you were first starting out in marketing today? <laughs> <laughs> I think young marketers should make sure that they know what they know and also that they know what they don't know. And I think they need to give themselves credit for the things that they do know. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things. I know that... Um, when I was a young marketer, it was actually my, it was my second job ever. And I was at a conference and we were at a conference session. There was a, one of my coworkers next to me, Doug, 
and we were in the session and I was frantically taking notes because it was on the topic of force free trials, which is when you send someone a trial subscription of your publication and you try to sell them on it, but they haven't asked for it. And I'm frantically taking notes because he's talking about this successful program that he put together that had above average conversion rate. And Doug leans over and looks at my pad and he looks at me and he goes, you're taking a lot of notes. And I said, I am. And he said, well, didn't your last round of force free trials get like a 2% higher conversion rate than he's talking about? Like he's talking about five, but didn't you get seven? And I was like, "Uh uh-huh. I'm taking notes. And he's like, so why aren't you up there speaking? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Better. <laughs> it, it stopped me dead in my tracks. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, should I be up there speaking? And he's like, well, if you got a better return than he did, yeah, you should be the one up there speaking. And that had never really occurred to me before. So I think that young marketers, again, know what you know and know what you don't know. But if you do something well, Give yourself credit for that. Um, And that was really when I started writing about the work I was doing and writing about it for industry publications, got me speaking gigs to talk about the work I was doing. And that's what really allowed me to go out on my own a bunch of years ago and, and start my own company. And, you know, I continue to write and speak about email marketing, one, because I love it and it's fascinating to me, but also I want to help people out there. I want to give them ideas about how to make their email marketing better and teach them about scientific method and how they should do it. So, um, you know, things like that, they'll help you in your career if you do them. They'll help other people, which is always a good thing. Um, But that would be myself. Give yourself credit for what you know and then um, share that and then keep learning. (laughs) Love it. I love speaking to you. So fascinating. Thanks so much for your time. Absolute pleasure, Jean. And, you know, keep, keep doing what you're doing and keep sharing all those amazing case studies that you have. Thank you. And congrats again on your book. And thank you. I absolutely love your um, all about email newsletter that comes out on Fridays. Uh, <laughs> it's always great to see it. I always look to see who's in there because there's always at least one thing that I've missed over the course of the week. And hopefully there's something from my blog or the only influencers blog or somebody from OI who's in there. So um, just keep what you're doing. You're doing a great job. It's so lovely to have you in the industry. I can't wait to see your session at Email Innovation Summit this year. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you.